Welcome to Just Men, a life-changing program that resonates hope as well as encouragement. The program that gives you information and inspiration for the glory of God. I'm your host, Jeff Tate, and thank you for joining Just Men. On today's program, we have a very special guest. This is his first time being on Just Men. Please welcome Leroy Jones. Brother Jones, welcome to Just Men. Brother Tate, <laughs> thank you for having me here, sir. Oh, man, it's a tremendous blessing for you to be on our program. Oh. And I tell you, we've been waiting for this moment. And, uh, you know, God is going <clears> to <throat> move so powerfully in this show, and I'm excited about what you're going to share. And I tell you, you add value to our program. And so we thank just you, thank sir. you for being thank on the program. Your program is value to the lives of everyday men like myself that need positive images and role models in which we can look forward to to keep us moving through our day-to-day -day struggle. So thank you, Brother Jeff, and thank you for the opportunity. Wow, that's awesome, man. Well, let's dive into it. Uh, let's start out and just talk about who is Leroy Jones. Well, Jeff, as you know, um, I currently, I'm a professional electrician by trade, but I spend the majority of my free time involved with juvenile crime prevention. That's my heart, that's my passion. Um, growing up, majority of my friends, the success story was to become a drug dealer and make a million dollars or live the, the Scarface dream, you know, the, the dreams of gangsters and, that we read about in novels or we saw in the movies. And the reality is something completely different when you walk into that life. So. I do my best to try to give kids a real perception of what it's like to live the gangster lifestyle. So I spend my time dealing with kids in the Woodland Hills Youth Development Facility. I work with judges. I work with probation officers. I work with youth development programs. Um, I currently teach with Christ Centered Ministries at Bass Alternative Learning Center in West Nashville. And you can catch me at any venue or function in which we're out trying to destroy that credit to prison pipeline that's been built through the zero tolerance system in the schools. Where they put kids out for any infraction that they feel like they don't want to tolerate. So basically that's who I am, Jeff. I'm the guy, the everyday guy who's out there trying to prevent kids from making the mistakes that I myself made growing up. Wow, that's good. That's a good foundation. Take <coughs> me back. You know, I always call it the story behind the glory. Now, you shared story the glory uh, in terms of how things have changed in your life and how you're mm -hmm. instrumental. But let's go back a little bit into your life and yes, what puts you on the path of destruction, self-destruction, yeah. before we go into this process of deliverance. Well, I grew up, Jeff, in a abusive household. My father was an alcoholic. And my father, he loved my mother, but my father was an uneducated man in the sense that he didn't know how to love. And a lot of times we see that in our communities where the love is really genuine in the sense that it's a real emotion that felt from one party to the next, but it's not a healthy love. And that's the household I grew up in. My father, he loved my mother, but in his love, it became possessive. And with the alcohol added to it, plus anger control problems, my father, I grew up watching my father beat my mother. I grew up watching my father beat my siblings. Well, my mother at the age of, at my, when I was six years old, my mother left him and divorced him. After a terrible fight, we had to flee Nashville to save our lives. So my mother took her and, and our, her kids, me and my siblings, and we left Nashville, and we stayed in an abused women, women's shelter. My mother married very young, so when we came back to Nashville after an, an extended stay at the abused women's shelter, my mother could not afford anything except for housing projects. My mother married in her teens. She was uneducated, had never held a job. Her job was to be a mother and a wife. So stepping out into the world without an education, without work experience, my mother had to rely on government assistance. So we moved to Charles Davis, um, projects here in Nashville, Tennessee, and from there I was introduced into an environment of drug dealing and an environment where violence was accepted. Now mind you, I had already grew up in a household where my father inflicted violence. So now 
I had been, I had seen violence from birth by the man that I adored most, the man that reared me more than any other man reared me, and the man that influenced me more than any other man influenced me. I had been taught violence through him, and now I'm in an environment that promotes violence, whether it's through the local gangs, whether it's through the drug dealers prote protecting their turf and fending their turf, or whether it's through police brutality that you oftentimes see in those type of communities where the police are just as scared as the, as the citizens are. But I grew up in that environment and the violence that I now was becoming acquainted with 24 seven in my outside community, coupled with the violence of the, that I was raised with in my household, I saw violence as natural. So by the age of 10, I was executing violent acts. I caught my first charge when I was 10 years old, aggravated assault. I hit a guy in the mouth with a two by four of a dice game where he tried to beat me for my money. I continued to spiral deeper. I got involved in gang activity at the age of 13. At the age of 12, I got involved with selling drugs. I started to get probation officers and big brothers and big sisters. My mother did everything she could to try to figure out what was going on with me because my mother had four kids. So trying to deal with one terribly unruly child, me, and raise three other kids, trying to find that balance was difficult for her. So she tried to seek as much assistance as she possibly could, as many mothers do. So I've been through D.D. Wallace programs. I've been through Big Brother, Big Sister programs of Nashville. I've been through the mentors and the probation officers. But at, at that point in my life, I was so, so angry. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand what I was dealing with. My mother not having the education to properly diagnose me because I had been to doctors who went to school and couldn't properly diagnose me. My mother not being educated and not knowing how to diagnose me to figure out what was going on with me, she just sought help as much as she possibly could, but I not wanting help because I didn't know, me not wanting help for myself because I didn't think I needed help because I didn't know what was going on with me. I began to spiral deeper and deeper. So at the age of 14, I served my first bid, so to speak. I did nine months in a juvenile facility. I got out three months later. I was serving time again. I did eight months. I got out three months later. I'm 16 now. And from the age of 14 to 16, I've only been free six months. I'm 16 years old now. I'm, I'm a seasoned gang member inside the institutions, the juvenile detention centers. I'm known, I've established contacts. I've established drug connections and I'm a kid, but I'm a kid with connections. I'm a kid that knows people. I'm a kid that knows convict habits. I'm a kid that knows violence intimately. From my household to the streets I grew up in to the cells I was incarcerated in as a kid. I'm a kid that knows violence on every level. So I can, in, I can inflict violence at an, to a degree that others might be afraid of or might have a, more conscience than I did at that point in my, in my life. They had more conscience than I did, so they wouldn't be willing to inflict that rate of violence upon someone. And that propelled me to the height in the gang community. So I became a gang leader, and at the age of 16, I was a, becoming a big drug dealer, a big gang leader, and lost deeper within myself. In a drug deal gone terribly wrong, I committed murder. A man lost his life. And at the age of 16, the courts decided to charge me as an adult. They were through playing with me. They were through taking chances with me and endangering society by allowing me to continue to be amongst society. And I received a 23-year sentence in the Tennessee Department of Corrections. So at the age of 16, I left the streets and went to prison. And I stayed there for the next 16 years and nine months. Man. That's, uh, just think about, and 
you know, in terms of this um, process of spiraling out of control and being in an environment and a condition that you were accustomed to yes, sir. Uh, that was conducive to that, yes, sir. what did it take? You know, you talked about all these things that, mm -hmm. that people try to try to intervene. Uh, and yes, bring about a change in your life. I mean, what we see today is a 180-degree yes, change. Yes, uh, we see a, a, a man who's been <coughs> redeemed, yes, a man sir. who's been reconciled to his identity, his true identity. Talk to me about what it took to put you on the pathway of redemption and the pathway to where you begin to see who truly you, was, you were as a man. I could sum it up in one simple phrase, which... God willing, I think will harder the essence of it. It took me knowing myself in the deepest and the most intimate aspect of self. When I say that, I mean it took me understanding that I was not the act that I was doing. I was not the things that I had done. That I am that which I am. Mm. And at the essence of all of life, there's one life. There's not a thing in this universe from the smallest atom that got its life from anything outside of the Creator. Mm -hmm. And I understood that if I live, if I breathe, it is not my own life, but it is the life of God living and breathing within me. It took me knowing myself in that aspect for me to change. And that was a very hard struggle. It took me being separated from my loved ones. It took me losing my world. It took the dismantling of my image and my, con my perception of self. It took the breaking down. It took, as the Bible said, by his stripes we are healed. Mm -hmm. It took the stripes. It took the contrite heart that I had to learn I had to go through prison, and I don't, I don't propagate the incarceration of our youth. I don't by any means think that that is the answer. But I believe that no matter what situation man is in, man can find the answer to his every problem if he can learn to dwell within and find the creator who gives the solutions and the science and the mathematic and the truth of everything in this universe to any individual who will ask. So for me, it was being in those dark, lonely cells and being so discontented and dissatisfied with my conditions that I was willing to completely and utterly abandon all aspects of who and what I thought I was to become mm -hmm. who and what he made me to be. And that took study. Mm -hmm. That took struggle. It took war like I didn't, like I had never imagined. I never fathomed how hard I would have to fight to save myself. It's many brothers and sisters who are doing today, they, who are in the fight right now to save themselves, they never imagined how hard it would be to save themselves. So they run back from, they run back into addiction or they run back into crime or they run back into, um, whatever it is that they're trying to forsake to become a better self, they run back into those old habits and, and mindsets when in reality you have to walk through that fire. And that's what it took for me, Jeff. It took me walking through the fire. It wasn't prison that saved me. Mm -hmm. It was me understanding, first of all, that I needed to be saved. And then second of all, that there was a savior. And then understanding the science by which he instituted for us to save ourselves. It took those three things, Jeff. It wasn't a condition or a place or anything outside of a knowledge of self, knowing what state I'm in and who I really am, and a knowledge of the God who made me, who created me, and who can, who can bring me back from the brink of death or brought me back from death. Mm -hmm. That's what it took, Jeff. Wow. That's beautiful. I know uh, you, you talked about two things in terms I want to want to expound upon, and it's the imprisonment of the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, many times we think it is a place, 
but it's really is a state of mind in, in yes. Luke 15, the prodigal son who was privy to royalty and he wanted his inheritance to become a citizen of the world. And yet he felt the word you use, discontent. Discontent. No matter what state he's in, Paul says he learned to be content. He learned to be content. And yes. Shakespeare says something powerful. He says that I do not wear a crown that man wear externally, but I wear the crown upon my heart. Not a crown that is decked with jewels or pearls or diamonds, but is a crown that few kings ever wear, and it is the crown of contentment. And many times it's that area that drives men to despair because he's discontent, he starts searching mm -hmm. for things. And amazing with your life, how God came in and did an inside out work yes, to sir. begin to work in. Many times we deal with symptoms on the external, yes, sir. but it's the internal. Talk a little bit about this renewed mind now and how this transformed life yes, sir. Uh, and the message that you give mm -hmm. now from this transformed life about renewing the mind and, and you said you study and do those yes, things. Sir. I, I'm so honored by the fact that people can look at me no matter their state, their condition or their circumstances, they can look at me and see an individual who has overcame. Mm -hmm. That's so that's such an honor for me to stand in that. And this is what God has allowed me to testify of, is that no matter how dark your hole, because I have been in some dark holes, holes literally. I have been beaten. I have been incarcerated. I have been broken. I have been battered. I have been in poverty. I have lived off of $5 a month. I have survived on 17 cents an hour. I have not done it for a week. I've done it for 17 years. I have been lonely. I have went to bed without anyone saying good night, without anyone saying they love me. I have woke up without anyone saying good morning or anyone saying they love me for 17 years. And I don't hold bitterness because I had a God with me. And the evidence of my transformation, my salvation, my redemption is inspiration to others that if you are walking in life seemingly alone, that God is enough. Mm -hmm. I'm able to show them that if you're broke and in poverty, then God is enough. <laughs> I'm able to show them that if you're uneducated, all I have is a GED and I have been flown across this nation to give lectures at colleges and seminaries. I sit down, I, I've sit down with presidents' daughters, vice presidents' daughters. I have sat at councils with clergy and, and, and professors and theologians to discuss the state of the, of the American community. And I'm an ex-gangbanger, drug dealer, and convicted felon with a GED. Anything is possible when you believe and you work. They said that he who strives for mastery shall not be crowned, least he strive lawfully. Mm -hmm. You can get all the higher education you want, and I'm a proponent of higher education. But if you don't strive according to the set rules and principles of spirituality and of God for everything in this universe, then it's all in vain. But if you have nothing else in this universe except those principles and you move in accord with them, then you can succeed and have your crown. That's the story I give to them. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to give it to them because when they see me walk, they hear me talk, and they see me move. It is not me they see walking. It is not me they hear talking. It is not me they see moving. It is the Christ mind in me, that Christ consciousness, that God mind that every single one of us possesses if we allow it to overtake us. That's what I like to give. That's mm. what I'm honored enough to give as a servant. Mm. Wow, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, when you talk about service, and I got to in our last five minutes to hit on this, um, Mother Teresa talked about, she said that love by itself is no good when it's just for the self and when it's contained 
uh, without action. Mm -hmm. And love need to be put in action. And love in action is service. Yes, sir. I was taught that love equals duty. Mm. You can't say you love someone or something and not feel an obligation there unto. Love equals duty. Mm. Mm. So how has love changed your world? Coming from an environment filled with hate, filled with anger, filled with despair, filled with brokenness, how did love transfer you? Oh, love is that saving grace, Jeff. Love was that saving grace for me then, and it is that saving grace for me now. Because if I was to be the man that I sometimes want to be, or that old man that I know may exist in some minuscule scale within myself, then I would be nothing. But the love that saved me, the love that birthed the new me, pushes me to remember that Leroy, when you see someone acting outside of self, mm -hmm. that it's not them, it's just an act from them. Because the acts that I created into, into this world and the ripple effects they're from, they weren't me. You could have hated me for being a gangbanger, but I'm not a gangbanger. Look at me today. I did the acts of violence involved in why I was involved in gangs. I sold drugs when I was when I was a drug dealer, but I'm not a drug dealer. So when I see people lying, they're not liars. They're individuals who told a lie. Love allows me to, and that's just an example, love allows me to look past the act mm -hmm. to see the person. Mm -hmm. Because the love of God look past my actions and saw the individual, saw the soul that was his own. And that saved me. So love doesn't allow me to reject anyone. Mm -hmm. Love doesn't allow me to label anyone. Love allows me today to speak some of the harshest truths to individuals and not hold offense at them for being in a state of mind where, it's sus where you're susceptible to tell a lie to me. I'll call you on that lie out of love, but I won't call you a liar. Mm -hmm. That's what love has allowed me to do, Jeff, is allow me to see through the act to the individual because love saw through me. Love, excuse me, love saw through my actions, Jeff, to see the real me. Wow, wow, that's beautiful, brother. I, I you know, you, you speak with such passion and really with power because it is love that got up on the cross. Uh, yeah. Everything redeemed us, yeah. reconciled us back to the Father, love. And it is that love is really the true power of God. Uh, it's an unconditionally called it agape love. Okay. It's a, it's a, and many times we have not learned to operate in that love, that, that the love that, that, that we sacrifice, we give ourselves. The word says it's a living sacrifice which is our reasonable service. It's acceptable unto God. And, and so when we realize we're not our own, that love purchased us at Calvary. Mm. Love purchased us and redeemed us yes, and reconciled sir. us. And yes, you said, and, and, and I, I like, you know, something powerful you said that reminds me, and I always bring this up every now and then, something is, as I call it, the parable of the Lion King. Uh, when the Simba, uh, was the uh, was a lion that was pulled away from his village uh, mm -hmm. because of shame and shame. despair, mm -hmm. and so he began to operate out of purpose. Yes, sir. And so one thing happened where this prophet came to him um, and said, "I'm going to show you your father." And his father has died and passed mm -hmm. away, and you know the story. And he brings him to this little water pit, and he says, he looks down and he sees his reflection. And in his reflection, he sees, he says, oh, that's not my father, that's me. Yes, and he sir. said, Sim then all of a sudden, the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of Simba came down. Mm -hmm. um, and through that spirit, it says, Simba, you know, you, 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 you have forgotten who I am. And he says, no, father, there's no way I would forget who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, Mufasa, you know, he mm -hmm. said. And uh, he says, son, you have forgotten who I am because you have forgotten who you are. 
we are the same. We're yes, one. He says, Simba, you are, you are, you are not who you become. Hmm. You are not who you have become. Mm -hmm. And so it's like you, when we look at our actions and we look at our life and we go, man, this is not me. This is not me. This is not me. I'm greater than that. Yes, and the spirit of God has moved through you, man, even today in this program, sharing your heart, man, about the love of God and really the forgiveness of God and the yes, grace sir. of God. What is the last word that God is really speaking in your heart is now that he's putting you in all these atmospheres that you're speaking into the lives of men and that those that come in contact that God is placing in your heart. The last thing I would like to say is that love is the power to move beyond any circumstance. Mm. Whether it's your love for me, whether it's my love for you, or whether it's the love of God unto us. Embracing love will give us the strength to move any mountain. Loving ourselves enough to show ourselves the image of God mm -hmm. in the mirror. And showing the world God by loving as God would love the world. The world would, know, the world would never get to know God until we bring him forth through love. That's beautiful, man. The Turkish proverb says that no matter how far you traveled on the wrong road, mm -hmm. <laughs> turn around. Turn around. Turn, turn around. around. And uh, you have exemplified the spirit of God and the transformation of God and the renewed mind of God living and breathing inside of you. Yes, sir. And uh, it's just so Thank powerful you. when we become in union with God where it's no longer us but it's him it's him it's him yes sir it is him last word of encouragement last word, last word of encouragement never give up never surrender god said i love that i should be known therefore i created man mm. you are the image and the likeness of the father mm. never see yourself as anything less stand up and rise almighty people of god Mm, mm, mm. Stay focused. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Awesome, brother. Thank you, brother. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> you guys best, though. <laughs>